Do we have more? <laughs> My life growing up. Okay, well, to, I have to make it short because um, I don't remember that much about it. Yes, I do. Um, well, okay, I was born in Minneapolis in the late 30s. And the first memory I have is a pink bonnet. And it was, you know, a bonnet that little kids used to wear, little girls used to wear, and be very appropriate and proper. I remember that bonnet. I don't know what happened to it. I don't, I don't know why I remember that in particular. Then um, my dad went into the army and stayed in the army through World War II. We saw him occasionally. My little brother was born, so we must have seen him at least once during the war. My little brother, Johnny, five years younger. We had nothing in common. He was just a pain in the neck. <laughs> but um, we would we would go visit my dad some places. But mainly we stayed in Minneapolis during the war. And then my dad, oh, I know. My dad came home and my little brother said, who's, the, who's that stranger? because he hadn't even seen, he was three years old at the time and, and he hadn't even seen my dad more than you know, once, twice, you know. And um, as a result, their relationship wasn't too swift, you know, I mean. And, and then when daddy was sick and ready to die, he and Johnny, buried the hatchet. It was just wonderful. They had a great relationship at the end of, his, of my dad's life. And Johnny, my dad would be so proud of Johnny today. And he knows what he's doing. You know, John, my dad knows what's going on. So uh, then after that, um, I remember going to school in Minneapolis. And after the war, um, my dad got a job in Rapid City, South Dakota, so we moved there briefly. His whole life was the Army, yeah, and he was still in the reserves. He, in fact, he was in the reserves for like 30 years, and finally they said, John, I think you, you just need to retire now. And he said, no, I can't retire. I just bought the new uniform, 30 years. So we moved from Rapid City to Bismarck, North Dakota to take over the ranch that was owned by my grandfather. But as far as my childhood, that's all I can say. Um, my grandparents, my mom's parents were just wonderful and would take me during times, you know, during the war when my mom would go visit my dad. And, and they were, they spoiled me rotten. My grandfather had a fridge down in his rec room in the basement and I could have any soft drink I wanted out of there. He had a slot machine and all the nickels that I won I could keep. And I always wanted to go to my grandparents. I didn't even want to go home anymore. That, that happens. That happens with kids. I became interested in journalism in high school when a teacher named Adrian Dunn, I even remember his name, taught one journalism class. And it was kind of an overall, you know, it, it didn't get into really great detail. You, we'd, we'd written a few things for class, but there's so much to journalism that you can't teach everything in one high school class. But I got interested enough in that that I decided I would major in it. And I, I 
learned that before I went to college, which was good. So I went on and took all the journalism classes I could, and it, was until, it wasn't until I went down to Northwestern that I realized why sociology courses are so important. Because writing is all about social pathology <laughs> than it is about normal people. I mean, and our, if someone is nuts, he'll always get, that'll always get in the paper. Journalism education should include the news. I attended the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, North Dakota, uh, science, literature, and arts school with a major in journalism and a minor in French and English. English was okay, but I still can't say Mercy woke up, so that didn't work out so well. We had the usual classes, but at North Dakota, the good thing was teaching reporting 101 was an actual reporter 101 guy in the plaid shirt, the green eye shade. He was just folks, and he was a newspaper man. And that was great because we got firsthand, not out of a book or not somebody lecturing, but firsthand the joys of reporting, joys. My most exciting moment, I can say, was when I was still in college, I took a course called Special Article Writing. And we came in on the first day of class, and the professor said, you're going to have to sell an article or you're not gonna pass this class. And you're gonna learn how to write an article so you'll be able to sell it. So don't you know, feel too intimidated. So the next day, about four of us showed up. The rest of the, the, rest of the people said, I, I don't have any confidence in myself to sell an article, so instead of, you know, wanting to really learn how, I, I guess. And if I don't pass a class, okay, I still had the class, I figured. So I, we had the class, it was great, a lot of tips. Um, our last assignment was to write an article that you want to market to a magazine or a newspaper. So I wrote about, at the University of North Dakota, there were twins who were blind. And I interviewed them because I wanted to know how, how are they getting along being blind and going to college. I mean, it's just amazing to me. So I wrote that article, and I have to admit, the professor did a lot of fine-tuning that article and editing it, because I think he wanted me to sell it, because it, it was a good subject. And I did sell it. I sell it to, sold it to the Minneapolis Sunday Tribune magazine. And I was so excited about that. I don't, I, I still remember it. It was really my first sale. <laughs> College did a good job, very good job of preparing me for journalism. I had all the courses I needed. Right after my senior year in the summer, I worked for the Bismarck Tribune and I knew it was just a summer job, and, and they knew it was a summer job because I was planning to go down to Northwestern. And <clears throat> I was kind of a reporter, street reporter. Whatever's going on, I can report on that, and which I did. And it was a lot of fun at the Bismarck Tribune, I must say. 
That's a great newspaper, Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper. From years ago, before we all were born, they won a Pulitzer Prize. I was hoping that when I was there, we could win another Pulitzer, but it didn't happen. But I, uh, after I graduated from North Dakota, I went down to Northwestern University, Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, and I got the idea that journalism wasn't mainstream being taught. You know, it wasn't a mainstream thing being taught. There wasn't a department of journalism that, uh, back then. And th while I was there, there did become a department of journalism. But you still, your, ma your major would be journalism. Your degree wouldn't be in journalism. It's in science, literature, and arts, which means I could say I'm a great artist. I've got this degree. I'm a scientist, wonderful scientist. I've got this degree. But anyway, the most fun course that I took was actually at Northwestern. It was called Journalism Photography. It was something that I that we had to make up there because we didn't have photography classes at U, either UND or Kansas. So the assignment was to go out and cover three events in downtown Chicago. And there's always something going on. So when I met this guy, we drove the car down and, and parked in Grant Park garage and there was snow and ice and water and everything on the ground. And we didn't know how to get out of Grant Park garage. So we opened this door and a, a little siren went on and like, don't open this door. So we rushed out and Jerry stepped in the puddle of water, ice cold water, that was probably half a foot tall. Um, yeah. And got his shoes and socks cold. So we went, before we even started this assignment, we had to go sit on a bench, park bench in, in Grant Park and wring out his socks and do that before we went downtown and looked for something. One of the events that we covered was, it just happened. We were walking downtown and here's a fire shooting out of an apartment building up about four or five stories. And Jerry disappeared. And we had gone out that evening in trench coats with the collars up. If we had to say anything to anybody, explain, we say we're from the Chicago Tribune, we're doing an article on, we're covering this, which of course was untrue and that I probably shouldn't have given us up now at this point. He went up to the story where the fire was as if, you know, nobody kept him from going up there. And I'm looking up there and I see Jerry hanging out the window of the apartment next to where the flames are coming out. I said, I don't believe he's taking this this seriously. You know, he's hanging out a window and there's a fire right next door. Well, it, I don't know if those pictures turned out because I never saw them. But he, he explained to me, he said, well, to, to be honest with you, I realize that I know a girl who lives in this apartment. And she said she, I could come into her apartment and, and look out the window and take pictures of this. So that's what happened there. Nobody arrested him or anything, you know. And we were inside the the rope that says don't pa don't pass because we had our trench coats on. I had a, a press card that said press on it, and I just I just showed it to him, whoever it was, and okay, you're you're okay. You know, I had a press card, and we. We got, oh, we saw T.S. Eliot was down in um, one of the theaters downtown. So we went out and waited. We couldn't get in because we didn't have tickets and we weren't going to lie our way in there. So we waited till he came out and he walked directly from the door of the um, place where he was appearing directly to his car that was waiting. And we had to get that picture right then of him walking. And Jerry got it, but my 
my strobe died. We had those big Graflex cameras that stick way out. And my strobe was the battery that kept going. And, and it, it had had it already that day. So I said, well, I'm through for the day. And so he got a picture. But it, it's, not, you know, it's not anything you'd use because it's just a guy walking. It happens to be T.S. Eliot, but it's just a guy walking. So it, we called that uh, was our action shot. Then the other thing, talking about the cameras, we, we found um, at uh, one of the theater, another theater, Connie Francis was appearing. Connie Francis was a um, popular singer of the popular singer, Pops. And she was cute chick and, and she was down there. And so at intermission, we asked her if we could take her picture. Oh, she said, sure, but just a minute, I've got to go into my dressing room. And so she went in there and she changed her costume. And then she said, well, here's what I want. I will, if, if you're standing over here taking my picture, I will turn my face this way. And when you're ready to take it, I'll turn around and go, like that. That's how I take pictures. And I said, great. You know, so we were, we were ready. And she, he said, okay, we're going to take your picture. So she turned around and we, we shot it. And neither one of us got the shot. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why, because my strobe was working. Oh, and Jerry, Jerry didn't have film. We had these film packs way back. He didn't have film in his film pack. So anyway, we pretended like we got the picture and she said, well, I'd like the negatives. So meanwhile, we're, we're still standing there wondering what happened and she, then she comes back and she's walking past us and she catches her lace dress on Jerry's Graflex camera and she just rips it off kind of and she said, Oh dear, I think I better change. So she goes back in and gets, and by then we think we better leave because we've already disrupted her intermission, ripped her dress, said, let's just get out of here. So that was another time. The other one was Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, who was a, at that time and a famous opera star. She was at Opera Hall and she was appearing, and we got a picture of her on stage, and that, that's the only one I got that was a good picture. And it was, in fact, we could, we could frame it and everything. It was good. And I realized that when I went to Northwestern that if I just took the courses that I had to make up, I had everything I needed. I didn't have to get a master's in journalism. Most people do decide that because journalism is so much on the job learning. It's, there's always a new story. There's always a new, something new to figure out when you're working in that field. And I decided I can always get my master's. I think well, I should just get married. So I married this guy who is also in journalism. My first job, which I got, and we managed to put my husband Jerry through his master's degree with my working, and he was working part-time too. I got a job at Mundelein School, and it was, um, it's, it was a Catholic school, and I did their newsletter for them, and that was fun because the nuns still walked around in their habits and everything. And one interesting nun, Sister Mary Donata. Sister Mary Donata was kind of short and she was a photographer. She walked around with this big, huge thing under her arm, which had a Graflex camera, which we used and, and all the equipment and with her habit on and everything and I thought that was really an interesting person and it was. Um, I did their newsletter, I interviewed kids and faculty and whatever and put it out and I forget if it was quarterly or monthly or whatever. 
and that was that was a good job. I had fun there. Probably the most interesting job I had, or the most, let's say it was educational, was my job with Air Force Magazine in Washington, D.C. And, and uh, my husband and I were there because he was stationed there in the Navy. Air Force Magazine was in a, the Riggs National Bank building, and it was in downtown, I guess you'd call it, Washington, D.C., a block from the White House. And while going around the building to go in the front door one morning, I saw all this red stuff on the sidewalk. So I asked some people, I said, what's that red stuff? Oh, that's blood. Blood, I said, he said, yeah, a guy was shot there last night. This job at Air Force involved, first of all, a lot of administrative work and maybe secretarial work and stuff like that because I was the first staff member who was a female. And they didn't know if females could write. This was in the 60s. So one day, my coworker Al Sholin, he was a colonel in the Air Force, and he was going on his two-week reserve duty, and handed me a pile of information and said, Judy, write my column for me while I'm gone. I said, oh, great, cool. But I, I said, okay, now this is all the stuff you work into it, yeah. And uh, so I could, I could do that. And then before he left, he said, now don't forget the cheesecake. And I was thinking of dessert, and he was thinking of some leggy girl next to an airplane to get the photo. So I wrote his column, and then um, Richard, the managing editor, said, um, what's your byline? And I said, well, Judy Dawson would be fine. He said, what's your middle name, Evelyn? Why don't we say J.E. Dawson? That way, nobody will know that you're a woman. They, you know, on because this is our first. They probably don't expect women to be writing articles and on and on. I said, "Yes, Richard. Okay, let's try that." Well, back then, there were organizations that d didn't recognize that women could write or wanted to write. Or, you know, they were supposed to be home and raising the kids and cooking. I mean, that, there were several occupations like that. I went to school with a girl who was majoring in petroleum engineering. And I said, Heidi, you're really, are you, are you going to get a job? She said, well, I hope so. I mean, there aren't any women in petroleum engineering, and I think there should be. I said, good attitude. So women were, I think the 60s and 70s is when women really blossomed out and, and went into what were men's fields and did it, made it. So after I got some more articles and I wrote, you know, quite a few articles then for the magazine, I got a job to interview on the phone the people in Fairbanks, Alaska, who had just suffered a flood. And the Air Force base up there was helping Fairbanks recover. So I interviewed the general of the air base um, by phone, and I talked to some other people, and I wrote an article on these brave warriors going in in the middle of another 40 days and 40 nights or something, and re rescuing people and helping. And so the next issue of Air Force Magazine, the uh, letters to the editor showed a letter that said, Dear Air Force Magazine, kiss J.E. Dawson for me. Sincerely, General 
and I forgot his name. So Richard saw that and he said, I think we can use your, your given name now. I think we can. The 60s, that was an eye opener for a lot of women, I think, and a lot of men in not only jobs like this, but other, other jobs that were previously men only. So that's what I did at Air Force Magazine. <laughs> Maybe I, I broke a, the glass ceiling. That was fun. And one, one thing I would like to say in closing, I started out with news. News is the, the word one should not forget. In this day and age when there's so much friction between people uh, because of our politics, the one thing you should remember is what Jerry used to walk around the house saying whenever the television news was on. He'd walk around just saying, just give the news, please. You know, and walk back and listen to the news. And, I, and he'd say, just give the news, please. Well, I had no idea that that really me, meant something to all of us. That just give the news, please, is, is something that I wish the journalists today would listen to because journalism is a truth. It's everything. My buddy. Oh, her buddy. Yeah, and my buddies. Those are my, those are my roommates right now. The dog. <laughs>